Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. First of all, a reminder of our prayer meeting this evening uh, at 7 p.m. via Zoom. If you'd like to be part of that and you're not already, just let me know and I can get you the access details. Ladies Bible Study, God willing, on Tuesday uh, at 10.15 in the church hall. And Wednesday night, uh, the Bible study uh, via Zoom uh, begins the new study on the Psalms. Again, if you'd like to be part of that and you're not already, uh, please get in touch and I can get you the, the access details for that too. I'm going to ask Merville to come forward now. He's going to give us an update uh, for next weekend. Thank you, Trevor. Good morning, everyone. Just a wee gentle reminder. I know you've already um, received the flyer by now, hopefully, and you saw it on the announcements. Or there, it's up on the screen now. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, next Saturday, two o'clock to five o'clock, Queen's Jubilee um, celebration here in Ballanderry. Everyone's welcome, and it's free. If you went to the Balmoral show, show, you get charged 20 or 22 pounds. Uh, we're going to put on a better show, the Ladies Fellowship Hour, and it's free. Uh, so please encourage neighbours, friends, family. It's a weekend to get them together. Bring them along to Ballanderry, especially maybe people that haven't been out of the house for a while. Now's the time to knock the door, give them a ring and say, look, do you want to come out even for afternoon tea? Um, join us for fellowship. Join us for fun. Uh, next Saturday afternoon. The vestry's in charge of the weather, so <laughs> not concerned about that at all. It's going to be a good day, let's hope. Uh, China sets, I know I've already seen some going into the hall this morning. If you have any in the car, <clears throat> you can drop them off at the hall after church or see Florence or Thelma um, after the service. Let them know that you've got that. Uh, thank you to the Ladies Fellowship, all those who are helping with the catering. If you'd like to make a contribution instead of helping, again, if you see Florence, Annette, Thelma, Alison, if you're not able to help but you'd like to make a contribution, on the day everything's free. We're going to have a little bucket at the desk as people come in down at the hall and it's going to have parish mission funds on it. And if people want to make a donation, that's fine. Otherwise, it's going to be a free day. Um, what else? Friday night, 7 o'clock. If you can, come and help us for a very short time, set up tables, chairs. I think there's 200 odd balloons need pumped up and left in the hall. Seven o'clock, Friday night. Saturday morning at nine o'clock, if you can, come and again, give us a few minutes setting up, holding a ladder, pushing some men up ladders, putting balloons up, um, setting tables and chairs out on Saturday morning. We're hoping it doesn't take that long. So it's Friday at seven, Saturday at nine. Um, and then, most importantly, uh, pray. We're planning a weekend celebration, fun, fellowship. Pray that as an outreach um, event, we will reach others. That people will see the hope that we have within us and that we're seeking to share. Really pray for that. The weekend's finishing with a family service here in church, half ten next Sunday morning. The Sunday school kids, any kids that we can bring, visiting kids, great. If we can get them to church next Sunday morning at half ten, as we seek to honour God and to worship him and to lift his name high. So we're finishing Sunday morning, half ten. Bring as many as you can. It's a weekend to uh, offer to cook somebody Sunday lunch. Bring them next Sunday morning to our family service and join with us in praying, attending and bringing others. Thanks very much. Thanks, Merle. And I'm really glad you said the best tree in charge of the weather because that normally gets landed at my door uh, and I can do nothing. The Lord is in charge. Um, let's stand to sing our opening hymn, number 652. Uh, lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us, number 652, for those who are uh, following at home. Thank you.
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And then the prophet Joel, chapter 2, rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us pray. As we sit, let's take a moment be quiet before the Lord and to examine our hearts and our lives, and then we'll join together in the confession on screen. We say together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 53, uh, beginning at the first one. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Let's stand to sing again. Number 112 in the hymnal, uh, There is a Redeemer.
Please be seated. Our New Testament reading is from Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who, by persistence in doing good work, seek glory and honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first the Jew and then the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favouritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish from, uh, from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, but by nature uh, things required by the law, they are, the, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing them, even, even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for those in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have, in, you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who, was, who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you. Who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Here ends our New Testament reading. Let's stand as we profess our faith 
in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we say together the Creed. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. As we do so, we pray for those uh, who have authority over us. We pray for those in government at Westminster and at Stormont. We pray for wisdom for them. We pray, Lord, for the uh, members of the uh, assembly at Stormont, Lord, that you would direct their discussions. Lord, that you would bring sense into the situation. And Lord, that resolution may be found. Almighty God, whose counsels are perfect in wisdom and love, we remember before you those who serve in Parliament and in the councils of this realm, that they may order the life of the nation in the right way. Help them to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly before you. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And at this time we pray for our world. We remember so many parts of the world where there is conflict and where there is suffering. We continue to remember the people of Ukraine, the people of Ethiopia and elsewhere. You know them, Lord. Lord, may your will be done. O oh God, we bring before you the deep divisions of our world. Set in men's hearts the spirit of penitence, forgiveness and reconciliation, that they may no longer distrust or fear one another, but be drawn together in understanding, so that in unity of purpose they may seek the way of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for uh, the mission of the Lord at this time. We pray for those who are serving the Lord in the mission field. And we pray for the mission societies that send them. Father, as we seek to share the gospel with others, help us to present it as the good news that it really is. The good news of your amazing love and liberating power made known to us in Jesus. Help us and help those who are on the mission field today to share it with the conviction as those who believe its truth, with urgency as those who know that the task is pressing and the time is short, and above all, in, with gratitude as those who have found in Jesus a living Saviour and Lord. We ask it in his name. And we give you thanks, our Father, for mission societies of the church, and for those who have gone forth from within their fellowship to preach the gospel and to further your kingdom in every part of the world. We thank you for all who in years past have supported and maintained this work. We pray that in our day, we may not fail to do our part, to share in the church's mission to make disciples of all nations by our prayers, by our giving, by our support. And we ask this for the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, we, uh, we pray for those who are uh, sick at this time. And we name them before God in the silence of our hearts. We name before God those who are in need of his help.
Heavenly Father, we commend to your love and care those who suffer in body, mind or spirit, especially those who are known to us whom we have named before you. In your goodness and mercy, grant them health of body, soundness of mind and peace of heart, that in wholeness of being they may glorify your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing again. And number 641 in the hymnal, uh, Yield Not to Temptation, number 641. As we come to God's word, let's just bow our heads for a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truths revealed to our hearts. Lord, help us to hear your word, to understand your word, and to apply your word to our living. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul continues um, his theme here within Romans of God's judgment on the lives of men and women. By its very nature, Rome uh, was an interesting place because of the mix of people that lived within it. It was a cosmopolitan centre in that sense of the Roman world. It was the centre of the known world in one sense at that time. As such, in Rome there were moral issues therefore 
coming through from pagan religions that would have been so strong within Roman culture and society. But equally, there was a strong Jewish community within Rome. Uh, therefore, it was quite obvious from the letter that within the Christian church there, because of the potential for baggage that they brought to the church, that Paul's teaching was required. He needed to guide and direct them under the word. We see that argument beginning here, but it will be developed throughout the letter. Paul's point, as we have said, is that God's judgment is coming. It is the reality that we live with and how we live our lives matters. It has consequences on how we will face God's judgment. Therefore, Paul in this chapter makes two key points. Firstly, uh, we have sin, other people, and God's judgment in verses 1 to 11. Paul has, in chapter 1, uh, talked about the gospel uh, and the depths of the gospel, the blessings of the gospel, but equally he has talked about those who have rejected the gospel and who will be condemned because of sin. Here in chapter 2, he adds on to this. He begins the chapter with the word therefore, and that of course means that we do need to look back, look back to the context, look back to chapter 1, to what he has said there. What he has said there is that sin distorts the creation purpose, remember? In the depth and the breadth of all human sin, we distort the creation purpose of God. The truth is, of course, as people, we like to rank sin. It makes us look good. But in truth, there is no hierarchy within sin. Sin is sin, and our sin, if we persist unrepentant and without Jesus, will condemn us. It says, you therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. The Lord sees us as we are. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows our lives. Nothing is hidden. And so Paul continues. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Therefore, Paul says, those who stand in judgment over others and yet do the same things are heaping, effectively, condemnation on themselves. In other words, it is as Jesus talked about in the Gospels. We are not worthy to judge one another because there is sin in each of our lives. And he used, of course, the illustration of the speck and the plank in a man's eye. What Paul is saying here is exactly that. Not that we are necessarily guilty of exactly the same sin. But that we judge someone guilty of sin when we ourselves are sinning against God too. The point is that in judging others... We set up a moral code whereby although we may be struggling in an area of our lives with sin, we're not bad because we're not as bad as other people. And other people, well, they deserve to be judged. They deserve condemnation, which Paul says that leaves you without excuse. It leaves you without escape from the judgment of God. God's judgment isn't based on on how we like to think about ourselves. It's based on the truth of his word and his promise. In God's truth, our lives are opened up before him. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is secret. You know, the, the youth version of Christianity Explored, I would use it with confirmation candidates, um, puts it really well. And it puts it like this. When you get to heaven... How would you feel when you go into the room and around the room are multiple screens all playing your life? Every aspect of your life is there on screen for all to see. 
There will be parts of your life in that that you will be embarrassed about. The reality, that is the reality, of course, of judgment. Each person in this world will face that judgment, not on a video screen, but in the knowledge of our Lord and our God, who sees what we're like. The Lord knows your life, and the Lord will judge your life. However, the greater truth that we know from God's word is, in the gospel, in faith, in all that Jesus has done, the judgment is something that we don't need to be concerned about in that sense because we have already met the judgment if we trust in Jesus. He has done all that's necessary. God has given us the opportunity for the way out to be different, to be transformed, to be faithful in sending his son to be our saviour. Dying on a cross whereby every sin is forgiven. Every sin is forgotten when we submit ourselves in faith and repentance and trust to our Saviour. However, the point Paul makes here is also valid. We who have been shown so much tolerance and patience and kindness in God's mercy and in God's grace, well, we have a duty to do likewise. Therefore, in that very important point, our judgment upon others is not appropriate. Remember the parable that Jesus told of the servant with the large debt, which his master forgave, and how the same servant with the small debt of his fellow servant, refused to do likewise. The judgment was all the more harsher because of the kindness that had been abused. The kindness that made no difference in his attitude to others. Surely that's the point that Paul's getting at here. When he talks about those who judge in verse 3 and 4 so when you a mere man pass judgment on them yet you do the same things do you think you will escape God's judgment or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance think about what that word repentance means turning your life around being different turning away from sin and turning towards the Lord. God has shown us his kindness in the depths of his love in giving his son to die for us in our place. And what he expects to see is a change in our lives. What he expects to see is our witness to his great mercy that we have received rather than a continued judgmental heart. In responding to God's grace or otherwise, Paul, as we see from verse 7 and 8, makes it quite clear that there are only two choices for people and therefore two outcomes to the choice that we make. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and for those who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Those who live to honour God, those whose lives glorify the Lord, will receive the gift of eternal life. However, for those who live a life of disobedience to God and live only for their own self-interest and their own pleasure, rejecting God's truth, there's a very different gift to be inherited. That is God's judgment and his wrath because of our continued sin. For Paul's point is a deeper one. Because what he is saying is that 
God's judgment is for everyone, every creed and every color. Therefore, in relation to the problems of the church in Rome, the problems that were there in relation to how some people were looking down on others, Paul is saying that no one can take God for granted. And that in repentance or attitude should be, a, should be a humble acknowledgement that whilst we are far from perfect and that as Christians, therefore we face judgment too. This is something that is clearly reinforced in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 where he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. What Paul was talking about there is, as a believer in each of our lives, there are things that are of us and there are things that are of the Lord. The things that are of us will be burnt up in judgment and we will pass through because we have the Lord. We will face a judgment. There are things that are in us that will be judged. Of course, the important thing is that in God's mercy, in his kindness, he has provided a way in which we can stand, under the, stand up under that judgment. And that person is Jesus. Without Jesus, when you stand before the judgment seat, you stand in your sin. When you stand before the judgment seat with Jesus, the Lord sees his son. In repentant faith, we acknowledge what we are. We acknowledge what God has done on our behalf. And we are changed so that we honor God and not ourselves. We allow ourselves to come under his rule. Coming under his rule means living in obedience to his word, including his law. And so we have our second point in verses 12 through to 29. Paul helps us to see the measure of God's judgment and the need for integrity in the life of the believer. Verse 12 and 13 says this, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. The Roman church was made up of both Jewish believers, those under the law, and Gentile believers, those who are without the law. But as believers, both Jew and Gentile, they are transformed by God's grace in the same way who we are does not make us right with God only obedient faith can do that only in faith can we live for the Lord only in Jesus can we have a heart that seeks to live in obedience to our God how we live matters we can all be proud people Proud to belong. The people that Paul addresses were no different. Verse 14 to 16 tells us that yes, Gentiles may be good. But we are, we are not all bad. Sorry, Gentiles may do good, but we are not all bad. But although they're doing good, may mirror aspects of the law. They're not saved by what they do. The Jews, on the other hand, in verses 17 to 24, were proud to be Jews because as Jews, they had that special relationship with God and as such had the law of God. However, the point was that the law that gave them their identity was a law that they were incapable of keeping. They had the knowledge of the law they knew what they should be doing to please God, but the reality of their lives was very different from their knowledge. And it's a common problem. 
All too often, there's a wide gulf in what we claim to know and believe and in the reality of what our lives are like. And if that's you, with regard to your life as a Christian, then God says to us, as Paul said to the Roman church, that there needs to be integrity in our lives. Whereby God is honoured in word and deed, where he is honoured in our hearts. That is, that we honour God, not only in public, where people see us, but that we honour God in private, where the only person he sees us is God himself. Faith taught means nothing if it's not lived out by those who preach and teach. And so Paul highlights the problem with three examples of inconsistencies. Verse 21 and 22. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhors idols, do you rob temples? The inconsistencies mean that God is dishonoured. As Paul says in verse 23, you brag about the law. Do you dishonour God by breaking the law? Equally, outward religious practice means nothing if it is not followed through with a lifestyle that we lead. Verse 25, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. And verse 28 and 29, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by written code. Certainly it was wonderful uh, for the Jews within Rome, those who believed in Jesus. Because of their knowledge of the word, they brought so much more to their faith in that sense. The word and the law had meaning to them. But for the Jewish unbeliever, there's a problem. Paul is saying very clearly that there are people who are living with double standards because of their failure to keep the law. Their religion in that sense was hollow because there's no integrity in their lives. And what he's saying in his teaching here to the Jewish believers is, don't let that creep in. Don't let that be part of your life too. Surely the thing is that just as integrity is something that the Jews struggled with, so too there's a greater problem if we as Christians lack integrity. We risk people not only dismissing us and the church, but more importantly, we risk them dismissing Jesus. And that's a serious thing for which we will have to give an answer for eventually. Therefore, what is the answer? You see it in verse 29. What is required isn't outward ritual, but inward renewal of the heart by the Holy Spirit living in us, sanctifying us day by day, making us more like Jesus. That is our aim in life as Christians, that we should be more like Jesus. We're to be a people honouring God in all that we say and do and think because of the cross, because of the difference that the cross makes in our lives now and in the future life with the Lord. The cross speaks to us of the standards of God's judgment perfectly met in his son dying on our behalf. Therefore, at the cross, and filled with the Holy Spirit as we believe and trust in Jesus, there needs to be consistency between our beliefs and our actions and thereby allowing God's truth to be heard, to be heard by others as it is lived out in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenge of this word. Thank you for the challenge of Romans 2 that speaks to us of the need to live for you, to witness to you, that others may see you. 
They won't see you if we're judging them. Help us to be faithful in our witness to the gospel that speaks of the forgiveness that we can know in Jesus. Lord, help us to be faithful. Direct us and lead us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing now our final hymn. Number 80 in the hymnal. Uh, Great is thy faithfulness. May God sustain you in all your works and in all your ways, make you humble, just and true, strengthen you in holiness and righteousness, and fill your home with love and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. <laughs>